your blood can make the fowls clean. I'm thinking, I think that your blood availed for me. It's not just a, a great truth of, of scripture, but it is a personal and, and deeply meaningful thing that your blood has availed for me. Uh, that I, because of your work, I can stand before you and say that I'm one of you ours. I pray this morning that we will grasp just a little bit more the depth, the richness of what that means, that, that your blood has availed for us. We pray that we open our hearts up to you as, as we go through the service and just pour out praise and gratitude for who you are and what you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We'll turn over just a couple pages to in 50, and we'll sing a song of praise to our fairest Lord Jesus. You're more than welcome to sit or stand.
it's your turn. <laughs> Take the stage. <laughs> back. Um, it, it was nice to get away from the snow, but now I'm glad to be away from the Texas heat. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably 110 degrees down there right now. So it's, we, we come up here every summer, so it's nice to, it's always nice to get away from that, you know, cool off a little bit. So anyway, um, I'm going to attempt to play How Great Thou Art. Okay, I'm in tune somehow. <coughs> it's not a banjo, so it shouldn't be a surprise. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, the pastor is a whole lot better looking than I am, and, and he's, a, he's a great, great pastor. Amen. But they gave me the privilege of filling in for him while he was away. Uh, and I don't say the fill-in will be that great, but I'm going to give it everything I have. Amen. Turn your mic on, brother. What? Turn on your mic. Oh, okay. Things on now, isn't it? Okay. We're good. Here's if, if you do say something, I might not hear you because I'm pretty deaf. Junior church. So if you say bad things, it's okay because it won't hurt. I want to have you turn over to uh, John, John's Gospel, the first chapter, please. I'm very grateful that as many showed up as they did because when the pastor's away, usually the crowd goes down a little bit. He is very good. He's a very great presenter of the word, and I appreciate the opportunity to fill in. There'll be other fill in as he comes and goes. Um, Charlie's back there talking to his wife. Don't listen to him, okay? Charlie's one of my favorite people. He and I have been sharing some good books over the last eight to ten years, and A.W. Tozer and Pinks and things and things like that. And I've, I've had a real hunger to learn more about who God is because there's many of us who, who think we have the word God is love and automatically we, it goes out on the air as well, if God is love, then love is God. And that's not true at all. Because love is only one of the, one of the attributes of God. <coughs> He is, he is the sum total of all of his attributes. And as, and as he presents himself, and as he deals with you, and as he judges you, or as he praises you, then it will be because it, he is a whole person with, in all of his attributes. And I'd like to show you that as we go through some of the verses that I'm going to deal with today. Because I believe that this, uh, the sense in which I'm sure you all know what the word metaphysical means. It means beyond the physical. When Genesis 1-1, when God created it, he at the same time in Genesis 1-1, he created all matter. There was not matter before Genesis 1-1. So when he created that, he created Adam and Eve and animals and stuff, stuff like that. So what I'd like to deal with today, in some ways, is the, the person whom God is beyond the physical. Because that's what he is. He's, he's not. It's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And, and we re really rejoice in the, the triune God because they do deal with us. Uh, but they all are God and they all have the same attributes and they all have the ability of the eternality of God. So in Genesis, Genesis I mean, excuse me, uh, John chapter 1, I'm going to read verse 1 through 4, 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Our Lord Jesus Christ uh, might have been the principal being in the creation, but he could have been a, a triune thing together. But he is John's apostle. John wants to tell us that he is God. That he is God. He's going to present to us a few things in the beginning. And I want to look over at verse 18 of the first chapter. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Now, if you... When I was in school, uh, they tried very hard to teach me Greek. It was Greek. <laughs> and I, I took three years of word study, but I didn't get through the grammar. Because I, I had trouble with English before I got to college, let alone Greek. So this word uh, in verse 18, declared him, means he came 
and opened up all who God was. Every place he walked, every place he talked, he presented God the Father and the triune God. So the very, very wonderful thing about the New Testament as we read, as we study, as we see the life of our Lord Jesus Christ, he is God, and everything he did was he said, I do all things that please the Father. So as close as they were, in the word, in the, in the 18th verse, is the bosom of the Father. You know, there's no place that two human beings can't get together than bosom to bosom. You take a small child who's born and he's nursing from his mother, there's no closer way unless they crawl inside and become one another. So here is our Lord Jesus Christ forever in the bosom of the Father. They were, they were so much alike and being God that each one operate almost like they were both the same person because he was, he was God. So here he is in the bosom of the Father and he has the opportunity to know eternally because he doesn't have, God does not have any progressive knowledge. If he did have any progressive knowledge, he wouldn't be God. Amen. Now that's something you, you got to think of. If God was without some point of knowledge, he would be less than God, hoping to be God. And somebody else would be God, but he isn't. He knows everything about you. We're going to study over in Psalms in just a few moments, but I, what I want to turn is over to is chapter, chapter 1, verse 47. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and saith unto him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile. Verse 48, Nathanael said unto him, Whence thou knowest me? Jesus answered and said, Before that don't call thee, when I saw thee that was under the fig tree, I saw thee. Omnipresence. One of the attributes of God. He sees everything you do. He lives inside of you. He walks with you. He talks with you. Jesus Christ is God. So I'm going to kind of put them together a little bit there if you want to. So the attributes are synonymous with all of them. And Nathanael answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Right away, Nathanael recognized the Messiah that Israel had waited for for a long time. Just because he said, I saw you under a tree. Verse 50, Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou that thou these things, greater than these things shall you see. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Hereafter you shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So, here, here is God in the flesh, our Lord Jesus Christ. And as we study his earthly life through the New Testament, we'll recognize that everything he did, every way he acted, every way he reacted, was because he was God. And he had all the attributes of God, and so therefore... He said, I do always those things that please the Father. Every, I, I don't think, I know that Jesus was God, and he, but he was still God when he was asleep. And so whether he was dreaming or, anyhow, the Father and him were so close that way up in the, the highest heavens was the Father, and down on earth was our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to turn over to John, John's Gospel, and to verse, uh, four, chapter 14, please. Chapter 14, I want to look at verse 9 of chapter 14. So let's go back a little bit further than that. Jesus, in verse 6, said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. He's the only way to the Father. You realize that Jesus was the only possible sacrifice that God could have put out. He was the only one who was sinless and perfect. In the Old Testament, when they would go into the tabernacle with a lamb, the priest would go through the fur of the lamb and the head and around the eyes. If there was anything wrong with that lamb, he wasn't able to be a sacrifice. 
So the only one that could have possibly paid for your sin and my sin was the Lord Jesus Christ. And he came. He obeyed the Father. And he chose to obey the Father. Over, I'll quote Isaiah 53, I think it's verse 10. It said, and it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Now, I can't, I can't imagine what it would be like to have one of my sons on the cross like Jesus, suffering hour after hour for other people's sin. I'd say, no, they're not worth it. But his father said, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. In other words, God looked forward to the joy of you receiving Christ as personal Savior and being saved. That was a part of him, part of his life, and a part of his love. And that's love that I, that I, I can't hold on to. Okay. Um, verse 7. If you had known me, Jesus said that I am the way and the truth and the life, no man come unto the Father but by me. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth you know him and have seen him. And Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father and it suffices us. Jesus said, Have I been so long time with you you have not known me? He that has seen me has seen the Father. How sayest then, show us the Father? Believe it not, not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, and he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the word of works sake. God in the flesh. The only one that could have died on the cross and paid for your sin. There was nobody else qualified. But the one qualified said, yes, I'll go and do it and die for them. Let's start, let's start over to Psalm 139, please. <coughs> Psalm, one, one, Psalm 139. If you get there before me, pray for me. Psalm 139 is, is the psalm of King David of Israel. And as you know that King David was a part of God's ministry and, and God sent a prophet to the house of Jesse to choose a king to replace Saul. You know where King David was? I would take care of the sheep. So the prophet looked at each one of the sons of Jesse, and he said, it's not him. It's not the one. God has not told me yet. So he said, do you have any other sons? So he said, yeah, I got a, a shepherd boy, David. He's, when you're the littlest in the family and the, you're not too, not too grown up, you take care of what the sheep, you take care of the sheep. And so he probably spent most of his days and probably some of his nights out there with the sheep. So King David's going to write this Psalm 139 under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now I'm going to go over the verses because I want you to see that as King David he talks to us about God the Father who is who's inspiring him to write this or the Holy Spirit. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down sittings and my uprising, for thou art, understandest my thought afar off. King David was he was absolutely sure that God had all knowledge. From eternity, God had known David. Because he has no progressive thought for him. Your name, my name was written on his heart forever. There was never a time in all eternity that God didn't know, know you and me. He said, Thou knowest my down sittings, in verse 2, and up my uprising, thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassed my path. The pathway from the day that King David was conceived was planned and put out by God. And you too. <coughs> thou compassed my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. But there's not a thing about King David that God didn't know. 
that God didn't work in his life and operate in his life. For there is not a word in my tongue, but, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. You imagine if you have if you have if you're married and have a wife, she usually tells you what you're going to say before you say it. Because she knows you. She knows how you act. So God does know how King David acts. There is not a word in my tongue, but thou, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. So here, here's the if you are a born again Christian. And God says, I want you to live for me. You better do it. Because there's, even when you down and deep in your heart without saying the words, oh, I wish I could do this. He knows it beforehand and he hears it when it's going to come out your tongue sometime. So David, David knowing this and by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's writing down, for there is not a word in my tongue, but thou, Lord, thou knowest all together. Thou hast beset me and behind and before and laid thy hand upon me. Amen. King David and you are controlled by God. Now you may get out of, out of God's will, but only because he allows you. Because if he wanted to stop you, you haven't got a chance. So he beset him before, behind and before, and laid his hand upon him. So it was not a moment after King David was conceived that God didn't have his hand on him. So when we get down to verse 6, he says, Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, for it is high, I cannot attain unto it. King David is a human being, and he, he does God knows. He does not know that. And it, it, it seems as though that we are so naive as to believe that we can, I'm going to talk about the darkness in a few moments, that we can get away with it. Even thinking about doing it, we don't get away with it. God may have to deal along the way with you when he knows you're coming to this particular point of where you're going to have to make a choice and he wants you to make the right choice. So, verse 1 through verse 6 means that God is on the sin. He has all knowledge. There's not a thing about you that he does not know. From day to day, night to night, and I suppose he knows your dreams too. Verse 7, Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I free from, flee from thy presence? You know, if you make your bed in hell, be there. You walk along the street and you're looking at somebody you shouldn't look at in the way you shouldn't look. He knows it. There is nothing that can hide you from God. Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, you're there. Of course we know God's there. But then he goes and says, uh, if I make my bed in hell, and actually the word hell in the Hebrew is the grave. It's, it's the, the lowest, because he's going to talk about the lowest parts of the earth now. So God is not only omniscient, he's omnipresent. <coughs> That's a part of his attributes. And, and God never operates outside of his total attributes. Every decision, every move, every planning, everything, it's him knowing you and dealing with you as God. <coughs> you know, it's, sometimes that sounds pretty scary. Because if God, if I walk down the street and I'm in the wrong place at the wrong time, God knows it. The wonderful thing about it is he still loves us. <laughs> okay. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, 
I've been watch, I like I like to watch the documentaries and on, on these documentaries it comes along and they have these islands way out in the South Pacific and they're nothing but trees and animal and beast and somebody gets shipwrecked there and you see a movie what they do <coughs> in a shipwrecked island as far as from civilization you, you you get to the point where you think that this is as far as I can go and there's I'm on I'm on the end of the earth. And so the illustration that King David has given us is that if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand, right hand shall hold me. You know the word hold, you've got a grip. Even if you're in the farthest, even if you think you're the furthest from God you could possibly be, in, in the deepest darkness from God, he's still there holding you. Mm -hmm. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light around me. So don't just think because you're in the wrong place or the dark place at the right time or the wrong time, whatever it is, that doesn't mean he's not there. <coughs> it doesn't mean that he's not watching you and see what you do. And, and he, he's not there to beat you up. He's there to hold on to you and to keep you out of what he knows will displease his God. Verse 12, Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. And, and I don't know how this struck David when, he, when the Holy Spirit told him that, but I know how it strikes me. Because I can remember times when I didn't want to think God was there. Verse, verse 11. Surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be laid around. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as a day. Just as bright a sunshiny day as you see out there, God sees everything, not only in your life, but in your heart and in your mind. And you don't hide from Him. His omnipresence, He's always there. Sometimes I, I get a point where I said, my car breaks down, I say, oh, God, help me. He's already been there. He may make it a little hard for me to get the thing going, <coughs> call somebody, but he's not, never there. When we get down to verse 13, we're going to a, to a different attribute, and, and the different attribute, I believe, is uh, omnipresent, omnipotent. He has all power. He not only has all knowledge, not only is omnipresent, but he has all power. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. There is no darker place for a human being than in the womb of his mother or her mother. His, hers or mother. So when we think about that, for thou hast possessed my reins. In other words, he's holding on to the whole boat. You can't get out of his hand. You can't get away from him. Even in your mother's womb, the darkness of your mother's womb, he is still there. And he's watching you form. Let's see. I'll give this one blonde hair and uh, give her blue eyes. Uh, I, I, I'm going to let her be a little chubby. Or maybe I'm going to let that be a little like. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou covered, covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Morrow's heart of the works, and my soul doth know right well. Here, here's, here's David getting into his heart and mind through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That even in, when he was in his mother's womb, Things were happening, and God was there, and seeing to it that you formed the way you should form. My substance, verse 15, was not hid from thee when I was made in the secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. I know, I know it sounds like I'm repeating myself, but he's there. Even before you were conscious, 
of being a human being. He was there seeing to it that you were taken care of. And watching you. And holding you. And planning for you. Well, I kind of thought about that for a moment. And I said, you know, why don't you make me a little bit bigger, Lord? Because I have a bad temper. And I'd like to smack somebody hard. But he made me. He made me. Not to fit my temperament. He made me. I better take care of it because this big guy may beat the snot right out of here. <laughs> Verse 16. Thine eyes did see my substance yet being unperfect and in the book. So God already had a book where he planned you out. You are who God wanted you to be. Whether you, whether you like me, when, when, I, when, I went to, when I went to college, in uh, one of my first classes, like I said a little while ago, was Greek. He didn't make me to handle Greek because he didn't make me to handle English. And I don't know why. He says, Yet being unperfect in thy book, all my members were written. From all eternity, God knew you and planned you and wrote it down. Which in the continuance were fashioned as yet as one day were none of them. In other words, in advance before he gave your father and mother the right connections that when you were formed you were already programmed. When a, when a, when a couple conceived, there are thousands and thousands of units and he picks the right one out. And that's the one that is, is in the conception with your, with your wife. He says, All my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. So God is omnipotent. You can't blame it on God. God made you because that's the way he wanted you, and he knows better than you. You better take what you are and where you are. Verse 17. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. Now, we're going back to God's thinking upon you. and He, he knows everything. But he's, he's thinking about you. He says, the thoughts that you have and gave to me. The sum is great. How great? Look at, look at verse 18. If I should count them, they are more than number than the sand. Have you ever gone to the beach, taken a, hand, a handful of sand up out the beach? Try to count them. Try to count them. His thoughts of you were more than the sands of all the sea, all the beaches, all the islands of the world. His thoughts are of you. I want you to turn over with me from Psalm 139. I wish he'd slow that clock down. It doesn't give me enough time. Let's go over to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 has probably been one of my favorite chapters of the Bible for, for, for generations. And, uh, and I, 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 I read down there, therefore, in verse 1, seeing we also are compassed back with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth easily beset us, and let us run with race to patience, the race that is set before us. If you look back over in chapter 11, and we're not going to we're not going to spend too much time there because I don't want to be too long. I looked at I looked at uh, well, let's let's go to verse 30 of chapter 11. Uh, by faith, 
The walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. But you know, a kind of to bring in a, a thought about, about that same thing, Rahab the harlot was in there. And, and, the, and the spies from the children of Israel came in, and how they landed in Rahab the harlot's house, I don't know, but they see they, they did. And Rahab had to make a choice. What does she tell her people? Or does she look out the door and say, these Israelites have come all the way from Egypt and they've beaten everybody all the way. What am I going to do? She chose the right way. By faith we have the heart at first, not with them that believe not. In other words, all the people in her, she knew that these Israelites were going to, were going to take, take care of them. And she received the spies with peace. So they, they, they said to her, now, when we leave, you hang this little colored cord in the window. So when our armies trample through your place and the walls fall down, you will be spared. She made the right choice. Uh, one of my favorites is uh, verse 33. This is, these are the witnesses that he's talking about in chapter 12. Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, and stopped the mounds of lions. King David, you know, he wasn't supposed to pray to God three times a day. Like he, that was his habit. And, that, and they tried to catch him, the other, the other people who were leaders in, that, in the Babylonian Empire. And they, they said, if, 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 we, if the only way we can get him is according to his God. And as soon as he heard, Daniel heard, he went right to his window toward Jerusalem and prayed to God. He chose to still obey God. And so in, in the witnesses of chapter 12, verse 1, we find that Daniel knew that the lion's den was going to come. So the lion's den came. They threw him in the lion's bed and they put a rock over it. And the king didn't want to do it. Because David, Daniel had proved himself to be very, very helpful to his kingdom and, 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 and wise. But because the words of the Medes and the Persians and the Babylonians can't be going back to him, he had to keep his word because he's silent. In the morning... The king went down as soon as day broke, lifted up the rock, said, Daniel, is the God you serve keep you? Yes. He shut, God shut the mouths of lions. He prepared beforehand. Now these, these lions were always a group of animals that were hungry. They kept them hungry because when they threw anybody in there, they wanted to go, he's gone. So they told him to lift Daniel out. And the people that tried to trick him into being, they threw their them, their wives, and their children. And the lions had a feast. As soon as God opened their mouths. So, so God, God is he's absolutely omnipotent. He can, he can do anything. And uh, I think I had one more here I wanted to talk to you about. I, I, Okay, verse, verse 17 of chapter 11. By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he, had, he that had received the promises offered up his only son. God said, Abraham, I want... Isaac was a promise, and I'm not going to take too much more time. Isaac was a promised one that was to be Abraham's progenity. That would be the nation that God had promised him. And... It tore his heart to tie his son up and get ready to take a knife and kill him. And God said, don't do it. And there was a, a, a beast, lamb or something in the bush. He was caught by his horns. God sent the, the right sacrifice so that the sacrifice would be carried through. And instead of his son, he took the lamb. 
So God is God is omnipotent. He can handle any situation. Now, okay, so I want to go over to uh, back to chapter 12 because I want to try to get to some of chapter 12. <coughs> Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed with that with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does easily beset us, and let us run with patience in the race that is set before us. For the first time as I studied this week, the Lord opened my eyes to chapter 11. And, and all the things, the whole chapter 11 is people suffering to honor God. Verse 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receive. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? God has the attribute of love. But when you don't obey him, that love leads him to chastise you. Amen. And you know, in, in, in reality, that is a blessing. Because I think that all these people in chapter 11 gained what they gained because they were being chastised, perhaps. God asked them to do that. Okay, when we get over into, in this, into this chapter, chapter 12, I want you to look down to verse 9. Let's look down at verse 7. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth us not? Now, now why, does, why does God want to beat your backside? That's because he wants you, like you have your children, and your children come in, and they do something you tell them not, and you say, you know, that deserves a spanking. And you give them a spanking. Why do you do that? Why do you give them a spanking? Is it because you're mad and angry, or what? Or because you're preparing them to go out of life and behave yourself and not get in trouble. Amen. He says... Verse 9, furthermore, we have fathers of our flesh which corrected us and gave us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For verily, for a few days, they chastened us after their own pleasure. Now, sometimes you'll say to your children, this hurts me more than it does you. Are we lying or are we telling the truth? But he said, this father, he's speaking about here, wants to make the kid shut down and leave him alone. But then it says in the next four words, but he for our profit. In other words, if God has to chastise you because you're rebelling against him, his love says, I want them to share my blessing. And if they keep doing what they're doing, I can't let them do it. So in other words, God's love his attribute of love is in reality in your best interest if you're, if you're disobeying God. Amen. Because he says in the next four words that we might be partakers of his holiness. In other words, he's leading us back to where we should be in obeying him and not doing the things that are definitely wrong. So the attribute of God's love can give you what you're looking for but also it can spank your britches when you need to be corrected because he wants you to gain the blessing that he has for you. I had a, I had a lot more, and I'm not going to spend too much more time, but verse 11 says, Now no chastening for the present seem to be joyous, but grievous. Afterwards it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So the Holy Spirit is telling the writer of the book of Hebrews, <coughs> It's not, they're not going to be happy. The kids are going to cry when they get their backsides beat. They're going to, if they have to go to the room or if they get, they get grounded for a week and can't do this or can't do that, it's going to be for their good. Because they're going to grow up not thinking they can get away with anything they want to. He said, afterwards it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised it. So, have you ever seen, seen a kid, after you spank them, they go, huh. 
because they're so upset because you spanked them. It says, Wherefore lift up the hands which hang down in the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. You do it because you want your children to grow up. And you're actually showing them love by spanking them. I remember reading an article one time where a lady said, uh, I can't spank my children. I love them too much. No, 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 no. The book of Proverbs is filled with that baloney. But you can't get away with that baloney. Well, it's five after now.